Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Lori, and today we're jumping into the book of Ruth and a little tiny bit of First Samuel. Let's just jump right in. As we begin the book of Ruth, I want you to ask yourself a question. Have you ever thought, where is God in my life? Is he aware of me and my doings? During all the big stories of Nephi, Sam, Moses, Abraham, all of the big players, does he even know who I am? Stay tuned, because if you've ever asked yourself that question or you're trying to ask that question today, the book of Ruth is for you. The book of Ruth is an amazing powerhouse book. It's only four chapters long. In fact, it only takes you about 15 minutes to read, even if you read it out loud. So it's a quick read and it's a great story. So today we're going to go through quite a bit of it. Let's do a couple things when we start. So we're going to do Ruth first. We'll do 1 Samuel. It's just verses uh, chapters 1 through 3 and a little bit later. But as we start into Ruth, uh, let's do a couple things. First, I want to have us look at a little bit of the setting and a little bit of the layout, and then we're just going to just jump right in. So first setting, second jumping in. Now, as we jump in, what I want you to do is ask yourself these questions as we go on. I want you to say, how is this like me? Because you see, scripture really is effective when we see ourselves in the story. How is this like me? And in the story of Ruth, there are a number of characters, Ruth, Boaz, Naomi, and some others. And I want you to see yourself in all of them, male, female, old, young, whatever they are, I want you to ask yourself, how is this like me? And the second thing that I want you to be asking yourself is how can I apply what they're learning in my life today? Now we're actually pretty good at that, is that application piece, but I want you to just peek into yourself first. What, what are you thinking, feeling? How is that like you? And then two, what can you do with that? What is it inviting you to do? Okay. All right. So the book of Ruth. First, a little bit of setting. There are only four chapters. Like I said, it's not very long. So if you haven't read it, we're going to go through some, but I want you to just go read it. Just stop what you're doing right now. Go read it. Okay. Welcome back. One of the things that's interesting about Ruth is it sets, it takes place in the setting of the book of Judges. Now, if you watched me last week, we already talked about the book of Judges and I cautioned you over and over again that the book of Judges is not all cheery and happy. In fact, it has a lot of violence, mayhem, blood, destruction, and, and not in a fun, fun way. I don't know if there's a fun way, but not in a lighthearted way, but in a very terrible sense. It's in that setting that we find ourselves in the book of Ruth. Additionally, Ruth is a perfect story where you can find the whole story in just a couple chapters. And that's unlike most other books. You can see that in Job and maybe in Jonah, but in most of the other books, like Sam, even in Exodus, it's a long time. There are lots of characters. So what's really great to look at Ruth is to look at the whole story as a whole. Say, what is this about? And how is it, what is it telling me? Like, how is it like the beginning? How is it like the end? How is that kind of repeating itself? Because you're going to see these patterns because it's this perfect little package. In fact, it's a beautiful story and one that I think we could spend a lifetime studying. Here's my shameless plug one more time. So I actually talk about it in my book, Real Heroes of the Old Testament by me. Thank you, Cedar Fort. So this just came out. And so this is, we talk about Ruth and the judges in here. So if you want to read a little bit more about her. Okay. So Ruth, it's in this time of the judges. In fact, that's how the book starts out. So I'm going to uh, start out right here in Ruth 1, 1. And it says, now it came to pass. It sounds like the Book of Mormon. And now it came to pass in the days of the, when the judges ruled. So right out of the gate, we see this is a time when things weren't going great for the family of Israel, for the Israelites. It was the time of the judges. Now we just spent a lot of time. So that's normally why you find it right after the book of Judges is Ruth, because they go together, at least in the timeline. So in the book of Judges, and then it keeps going. And it says that there was in the time when the judges ruled, that there was a famine in the land. Okay, bad news, more bad news. Now famine happens often, but it's usually a sign of some kind of a disfavor. Things aren't going great. So they really need the Lord's hand right now, but things aren't going great. There's a famine. So it's the time of the judges reminding us of this terrible time and there's a famine. Uh-oh, bad news already. So we're already like, this isn't gonna be, this is gonna be a tough story. There's a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi, and the name of her two sons were Mahon and Kilian. Ephrathites, Ephrathites, 
Zites, yeah, that one, of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came to the country of Moab and continued there. Now, let's talk about what the setting is, because this is important. So remember, when the Israelites settle in the land of Canaan, they're given certain lands according to their tribes. Now, they are in this Ephrathrathra, that word that I had a hard time with, which is really the area of Bethlehem. So they're in there. Now, Jerusalem, it's just really a suburb of Jerusalem, just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is the city we know it doesn't exist yet. That's going to come later. So it's telling us these guys uh, are coming from the same town, that uh, Jesus is going to become come from and also be born in Bethlehem and also David. So we're like, okay, so they are Israelites. They're born there, but they're going to move and they're going to go to Moab. So the first thing we should be asking ourselves is why are Israelites leaving the promised lamb land and going somewhere else. And so that's one of our themes, right? We're usually coming back into the land. Then we see Jacob and some of the others leaving, but they return. So you're like, oh, this is already strange. Why would they leave the promised land? We heard about it. It was a famine. So Moab, they're going to Moab and not the place where you ride your mountain bike in Southern Utah, but this is in the North and the East of Israel on the other side of the Jordan River. Now in the past, have the Moabites been friends or enemies of the Israelites. They've been enemies. So it's so bad. The judges, the land of the judges, it's not going great. There's a famine and they're going to move. Now, one of the other things we've learned about is there isn't a lot of backstory in characters, motivations, and things often. And one of the ways we learn more about them is the name meaning of their names. And so Elimelech is the name of the dad. And Elimelech, it means Elohim is my king. So you're like, okay, seems like a faithful guy by the name. Naomi is there as well, but their kids are really important because their kids' names are Death and uh, Death and, hold on, Death and Sickness are the names of the kids. Naomi uh, means pleasantness. And so you're like, okay, pleasantness, good name. And Boaz, we're going to meet him in a minute. He means strength and we think Ruth means friend. So you're kind of, if we started on a story, we said, there's a guy named God is my king and his kids are named sickness and death. You're like, oh no, I bet I know what happens to them. And sure enough, they're going to die. In fact, all three are going to die. So they move to Moab, they move there. And then I'm just spoiler alert, sorry, but they move there to Moab and the two sons get married to Ruth. She was from Moab. So she's uh, not an Israelite and is the other daughter-in-law. And those are the two daughter-in-laws. But then the two sons, sickness and death, do indeed die. In fact, the dad dies and then the sons die. So you're like, wow, this is a tough time, but already our setting is telling us things get really tough. Now we hear about tough times in scriptures. This is a new, we have tough times in our lives. However, this story is a little bit unique because these are just normal people. They're just people who are living and they move and they get married and then they die. So what's one of the really great things about the strength of the story of Ruth is it's a story of everyday people, right? So you're like, okay, this is like my story, right? They're just everyday people living everyday lives when tragedy strikes. So Orpah um, and Ruth are now there with Naomi, their mother-in-law. And Naomi's, hey, there's nothing here for me anymore. And she also says, my daughters, there's nothing here for me. So I'm going to move back home, basically to Bethlehem. But there's nothing here for you. I can't have any more sons. There's nothing I can offer you. So go back to your families. And Orpah, which just as an aside, is actually where Oprah Winfrey gets her name. They spelled it wrong. She talks about it in a BBC interview. But her name was, as, so it's Orpah Winfrey, but they called her Oprah. So it's the same biblical name. Anyway, both Moabites, the daughters-in-law, Naomi says, hey, don't stay. They both are like, no, we'll stay. And Naomi insists, no, go back to your to your parents. There's nothing I can offer you. My sons have died and I don't have anything. I'm now widow. And in those days, that was important. That's who made a living were the men and the women didn't have as much. Uh, they were very vulnerable. And Orpah leaves and, and leaves with the blessing of her mother-in-law and goes back home. But Naomi doesn't. And so here we're, or Ruth doesn't. She stays with Naomi. And this is where we find one of our great lines. And so I'm going to go back to the book and read it myself. So I'm in Ruth 1 verse 16, famous line. And, and so Naomi turns, we're going to do one verse before verse 15, just so we can build up to it. And she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back into her people. This is Naomi talking to Ruth. So Naomi, mother-in-law, hey, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people 
and unto her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. She's go back, go home, Ruth, there's nothing I can do for you. And here's Ruth's response. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people and thy God, my God. Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do uh, unto me, then more also, it ought to, I'm sorry, if aught but death part thee and me. I should put my glasses on. Okay, so we've heard this. Whether thou goest, I will go. Wherever you go, you know, I will be buried there, and your God will be my God. It's an oath, right? She is swearing that she will continually stay forever and just be ever loyal to her mother-in-law. So it's almost a ritualistic oath here, but we, I love the compassion and passion. Ruth doesn't have to do this. There's nothing for her. Her husband has died. Her mother-in-law doesn't have a, a husband either. They've all died. And yet she she's not going to let Naomi, her mother-in-law, be alone. So it's a beautiful promise. And from that moment on, Naomi never turns her aside again, either tries to convince her lovingly to return, because we see that that power of that oath, wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you will lodge, I will lodge. And she swears, I will, your gods will be my God. So she's, I'm in, I'm all in. So a beautiful promise. So we learn from Ruth that Ruth is, Ruth is exceedingly loyal. So during this troubled time, we learn that Ruth is loyal. So we've now met our main two characters, Naomi and Ruth. Okay. So I want you to, as we keep going, see yourself in those stories. Okay. So they continue on. This is still chapter one. So we're almost done with chapter one. And then I love this in verse 18. Now, speaking of Naomi, it says, when she saw that she, Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. There was no arguing with her. She was clearly coming. And verse 19. So they, so the two went so they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. So the whole town, these people are coming back. So they gather around who's coming back to town. And they're like, well, is that Naomi that just left a few years ago? We remember her. And she's, don't call me Naomi. My name is Mara. And Mara means bitter. So she is, my life is bitter. Call me bitter. Because she says the Lord has dealt bitterly. Now, something interesting. In Naomi's mind, the Lord has forgotten them. So she is referring to the Lord here. Hey, the Lord's forgotten me and has caused this to happen and has not remembered me. Okay, so that's where we're Now, so the people are introduced. So we're going to see this beginning story of this tragedy, the setting, the tragedy. We meet our main two characters to begin with. We're going to meet Boaz next. But we also see where the townspeople come together. The story is starting with the townspeople coming together and Naomi saying, I've had this tragedy happen to me and I think maybe the Lord isn't blessing me. And we're going to see that contrasted in the end, that same exact part of the story. Okay, got it? Okay, so what's this about? This is about normal life, right? This is about things that happen to you and I that are just tragedy happens. We try to do our own uh, things. We try to uh, live a good life. And yet tragedy is going to befall us. Famine, death, family disasters, financial ruin, all kinds of things. And we're like, well, here we are. So the story of Naomi and Ruth is very much like our day-to-day -day stories. And I love that. So we're like, okay, this is this could be my story, sadly, but okay. So we're gonna see what happens next. So let's jump to chapter two. And then we're gonna be introduced to our next character. Chapter two, verse one. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Boaz means strength. So we're gonna say, okay, we're meeting this guy and right out of the gate, his name is Strength and he is a distant relative. He's a relative of the, of the family. And Ruth the Moabites, she's a foreigner, right? So she's a foreigner, said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And her hap was too light on, on part of 
the field belonging to Boaz, who was the kindred of Elimelech. Okay, so I don't know a lot about farming, but let me tell you what some of the welfare rules are. So uh, Naomi's eld- a little more elderly. So Ruth says, I will go out and try to find food for us. Now, it's part of the barley harvest. So it's time of the harvest when they arrive there. And so they're getting like the stalks of barley, whatever barley looks like. And the grains on the the top and the uh, chaff is on the bottom. And what you would go out and do is they would go out and gather those up. You've seen where they do shocks of wheat or barley. So they gather them up like this. And so the gleaners and the farmers are helping Boaz, right? They're the hired help of Boaz, this barley farmer who is is well off and is a distant relative. So she's going to go out and gather. Now she's not hired, but one of the welfare rules of the time that we read in Leviticus is that you were supposed to leave the corners of your field harvested so that anyone who was down on their luck or poor could come by and gather it. Additionally, if you dropped certain amounts of them, you're supposed to leave them additionally for someone poor so they could come by. So it's a great welfare system. It isn't necessarily a handout or anything, but if someone's really down on their luck, they you're leaving some for them and they can come gather. So that's what Ruth is doing. So Ruth shows up, she's younger, right? So she can do this backbreaking labor. So she goes out and she's gathering up the barley from the corners or the stuff that's fallen. And she just happens, she just happens to go to Boaz's field. And then again, remember it says that Boaz uh, was this family member. And here's what we learned from Boaz. So just listen as we describe the story of, or just how we're introducing him, our next character, because he's our next big character in this story. So we've met Naomi, bitter, Ruth, very loyal, but foreign, very foreign. So they would have been, uh, remember, they would have been a little bit like, ooh, foreigner, not sure, and our ancient enemy, but we're not really sure about her yet. So here's how we're going to introduce uh, Boaz. And I'm in verse four of chapter two. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Who, whose damsel is this? And the servant said, that, uh, the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It's the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers uh, among the sheaves. So she came, and has she continued, even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. So she says, Who's that girl? And they said, Oh, that's, uh, that's, you haven't heard? Oh, that's, uh, that's. Ruth, and she's a foreign, but we already know about her. She's been great. She's been trying to help out Naomi, and uh, she's been here all day. She asked if she could just do the gleaning part, and I said, yeah, this is a servant. I, yeah, 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 you can do it, and uh, and she's been working all day, except just for a, sm- a, sh- a short break that she took over at the uh, campsite that we have for the gleaners, and wow, and so Boaz is not, but no, did you notice the first thing we did when we met him? When he walks out, he's wishing the blessing of the Lord onto his workers. And they immediately respond back in kind. This is a great man. This is a man who is a faithful man. Now we learn later he's a little bit older, in fact. So he's a hardworking guy. He loves his workers and his employees and he blesses, the wishes the Lord's blessing. So the first thing we notice about him is, is he's a faithful man. And then he immediately knows, notices Ruth, talks to the foreman. The foreman's like, she's been working all day, whatever. And then what's Boaz going to do? Our introduction seems pretty good of him, but what's he going to do? And then we read the next verse. And then Boaz, verse eight, then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by the maidens, lest thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they should not touch thee? And when thou art uh, athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Ruth, I'm sorry, Boaz realizes who Ruth is and her loyalty and her love for Naomi. Everyone in town's heard. And so he tells her, don't go to other fields. You can harvest right here where it's safe. And and I've told the men not to 
bug you or bother you or catcall or whatever. So you're safe here. And in fact, he leaves a provision for like, you, you, you can even get water from our water that the men have drawn, the, the, the jars that they've drawn. So he's really looking out for her. And so what is she? So we're like, wow, this Boaz, great guy. He could get out of here, get out of here. No, he actually helps her out, realizes that she's a vulnerable young woman and makes some concession for her to continue to work there. And then she responds. She says, then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing that I'm a stranger? Like Boaz, why are you being so kind? I'm a foreigner. I'm an immigrant. Why are you even being nice to me? It's a rich guy. And, uh, and he answers in verse 11, and Boaz answered and said unto her, it hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. And how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come into a people which are, are thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. So he says, and I'm sorry, it's clunky reading, but Boaz realizes, he says, why are you doing this for me? And he says, I have heard about how loyal you are to, to your mother-in-law and, and you haven't left her. So he just feels this great compassion for her because of her great loyalty. So her great loyalty is being paid back, repaid in Boaz, a good man, a man who is doing the things that the uh, law of Moses command him to do, right? He's left the fields a certain way. He's asked his men to not pester the women. He's uh, provided water and shade and protection for them and lets her do all of these things. So we realize he's a good man doing the, just obeying the day-to-day -day laws that he should. He honors Ruth for her loyalty to Naomi. And so even though she's a foreigner and even though she's a young woman who's you know, is working in his field, he is, I'm going to help you out. And so she said that. And then she says in verse 13, chapter two, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me. And for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I not be like unto one of thy handmaids. And Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip the morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was uh, sufficed and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz com commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not and let fall also some of the handfuls on, of purpose on her for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So he's even, he goes out of his way even more. So he's, you know, come eat lunch with us and provides bread. And then they dip it in uh, vinegar oil. So they're like, you know, bread and butter kind of thing. So they're like, hey, have lunch with us. Okay. And then he even tells the guys, hey, you guys, when you're gathering up these uh, shocks of barley, let a few fall, let a few extra fall so that she has enough not only for her, but for her mother-in-law. So he, he continues to just bless her. So you're like, okay, this is cool. Boaz is cool. Ruth is working hard and he's really going out of his way to bless her. And, and then it says she, so she, they do that. They let some extra fall. So she gleans that, picks that up. And then and until the evens, she works all day. And then she beats out what she had gleaned. What a stock looks like but if you have a stock of barley the top of it right like wheat has the grain and beat it and then you throw the chaff up and the chaff blows away and the glean and so you gather the grain and so as you gather the grain she has a, a bunch she has she's like 30 or 40 pounds worth so she works all day but because of what they're helping blessing her with she is able to get enough and so she takes all of this home so you're like okay this is awesome Boaz shows up, Ruth's awesome, Boaz is awesome, protecting her. The story's really starting to take a turn. Okay, so that's how about chapter two is about to end. Yet one more thing, Ruth goes home to Naomi and brings this bunch of barley home. And so as she brings it home, her mother-in-law says like, where have you been all day? This is a crazy amount. Like, how has this happened? And Naomi, and she says, I, I, I was gleaning all day and I just happened to be in the field of Boaz. And then Naomi, verse 20, and Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, blessed be the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, 
the man is near of kin to us and one of our next near kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabitess said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, and they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and then of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Okay, so they realize their fortunes are changing and Naomi starts to put it together. I know who Boaz is. He's one of our kinsmen. He's one of our near kinsmen even. Not near enough that clearly they went to him for help, but near enough that she's, I know who that is. And yes, stay there. He's a good man. Stay there and keep uh, doing what he suggested is gleaning and harvesting there. So she stays through the entire rest of the harvest. At the end of the harvest, we hit chapter three. Now, as you get to the end of chapter two, be asking yourself, this is a story about regular people going through regular trials and they seem to be good, but so far, what is this really about? Now, remember the question we asked at the beginning, is the Lord really aware of me even during my normal day-to-day -day things? Is he there? And I want you to notice something as we continue the next couple chapters and see if you can see it. Where's God in this story? There's no miracle of the Red Sea. There's no Passover. There's no plagues. There's no things like we've read in Exodus, right? There's no wonders being performed. There's references to God, right? They say, oh, I might be uh, blessed by God right now, or I might have had a tough time. But the narrator, nobody's telling us what God's doing and what God's thinking. Where is God in the story? We've learned about Ruth and we've learned about Naomi, and we've now learned about the character of Boaz, Where's God in the story? It is in the scriptures after all. Why is this story in the scriptures? All right, let's keep reading. At the beginning of chapter three, the story takes a little bit of a turn. And this is where Naomi, Naomi realizes that the harvest is about um, done. And so she knows that Boaz is single. He's an eligible bachelor, a little bit older man, but says realizes what's happening. And so she is going to give um, her daughter-in-law some, uh, some dating advice. And so she's, hey, Ruth, I want you to do a thing. I want you to, to change your looks a little bit. You're wearing your morning clothes, mourning for your, and it's time for you to let people know that you are available again, available for marriage and dating. And so you're going to change your morning clothes and you're going to change your clothes. And then when you go to the barley harvest at the end, they work really hard. They have a party. I was thinking like a barn raising. And so as they have that, I want you to approach Boaz and, and basically let him know that you're interested. And so this is, this is how they do it. So she says, um, this is Naomi's really great dating advice in chapter three, verse four, uh, when it shall be, when he we're talking about Boaz, lieth down. Remember, this is a really long, like they're going to be out all evening doing this a barley harvest, a sweet harvest. And so they're going to be tired. So they're just going to uh, be out in the summer, end of the summer. They're going to be out there sleeping in the fields. And so when this happens, I want you to, she, he, when he lies down at this time in the evening, thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down and he, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And Ruth was like, oh, okay, I'll do it. So this is a little bit uncover his feet. He, let's say he's out there sleeping and she's going to uncover his feet and then just lay there. So at one point he, that's what she does. So they've worked all day, they're exhausted and she, he's asleep. And again, this is out in the fields, right? After the harvest and she uncovers his feet and lays down there. And it says he wakes up startled and is like, who, what who's down there? Who's down there? What's, who's sleeping on my feet? Who's touching my feet? And she's, oh Lord, it's just, it's just me, Ruth. And, and what do you want me to do? And he says, and she asked for protection. So he says, okay, I'll cover you with the uh, corners of my cloak. And basically I will protect you. I will protect you. And so he says, blessed, this is verse 10 of chapter three, blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. And as much as thou Follow us not young men, whether rich, uh, whether poor or rich. And now my daughter, fear not. I will do unto thee all that thou requirest for all the city of my people doth know that thou are a virtuous woman. So there's nothing untoward going on with this feet thing. It isn't some kind of euphemism for something else going on, but she interrupts his sleep and then she makes it known. Hey, I'm, you know, 
I really like you. And so he's, I like you too. And so he, I need your protection, right? And she's, he's, hey, I love this part though. I love your loyalty, but I also see that you didn't go after the good looking or the young ones, but just me, just a normal guy. But he's a really faithful, good man, as we saw, and he, she's chosen really wisely and he's chosen really wisely. So we're like, oh, this is so cool that these two people are coming together. Someone who is a good man, who he's maybe not as good looking or as young as some of the other farmers in town. And she is an immigrant and poor, yet a hard worker, loyal and beautiful. And so they're like, hey, and he says, you know what, I'll protect you. And so he tells her that. I will do that. So he says, okay, so here's the, remember Naomi told her, do whatever he says. So he says, all right, tomorrow we'll meet at the town gates and, and I'll take care of it. And this is where we're introduced to another custom. That's a little bit different. It's called the kinsman redeemer or the near kinsman. But one of the laws of Leviticus is that if one of the near kinsmen, a certain, the, one of the patriarchs of the family, remember the women, the orphans, the widows, they're a lot more vulnerable in this society. They can't just go get a job or do some things. They're very, not as protected as we are in this, in our society today. And so they, one of the laws to protect them was that one of the men of the family, if they were unmarried, would marry them and that would help um, continue the line that would bring them in protection and give them a kind of salvation as a family member. But uh, one of the other things that sometimes they do too is if they've fallen on hard times, say in debt or, or debt slavery, they would redeem them. So this kinsman, this family member, near family member is called the kinsman redeemer, the one whose assignment it is to say, when this happens in the family, your responsibility is to save them, is to redeem them. It is often the responsibility of the oldest son. And that's why he gets a double portion of the uh, inheritance from his father. So he doesn't get everything, but he gets twice as much as all the other brothers because his job is to use that to do exactly what's happening here is to support the family members, the widows, the orphans, uh, those that have sold themselves into slavery. That's literally what the word redeem means to pay off their debt. They are going to be the kinsmen redeemer. And it's Boaz's assignment. He is one of the nearest kinsmen. So they're going to say, okay, we can take care of this. I can be your kinsman redeemer. And so they say, yep, I will meet you there. But they say, hey, there's a, there's, so the story kind of continues. The very last chapter, it, it, chapter four, it says, then when Boaz goes up to the gate, so everything is always taking place at this gate at the, uh, remember when we started, when they come into the town at the gate, the women are like, is this Naomi? She's like, call me better, right? And so it's the same place. So we're back. The story is ending where it began. We're at the city gate. This is where all the judgments take place. It'll often say the judges meant at the gate. That's where it's like the market. So they're going to go there. So Boaz is going out to the gate and he sits himself there and behold, there's this other kinsman. So there's somebody else that's a little bit closer related to Naomi and Ruth and so could potentially marry Ruth. And so Boaz is like, hey, I'll take care of it. I will uh, step in front of this, this other kinsman. But the other <coughs> the unnamed kinsman in this case uh, is near in rel and uh, rel re near relation. And so he can do it. So Boaz puts it out there. So he says, okay, so he waits out there for this nearer kinsman, the unnamed closer relative to show up. And he wants to marry Ruth now. So the other, it says, and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spoke came by unto whom he said, hey, ho, such a one I turn, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Hey, come hang out with me. So this unnamed guy, okay. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city, sit ye down here. And they all sat down. He's putting a, a council together. Hey, everybody, come sit with me. So that he's setting this up. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And he said unto the kinsman, uh, Naomi, that's come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our, our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people, if thou wilt redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it besides thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. So remember, the near kinsman can do it. So this is this unnamed kinsman. Hey, so I, I know Naomi, she's got some land. She's going to sell it. It's your right first. Hey, elders and guy, do, do you want to redeem it? Do you want to pay for it? 
and uh, take it over. And the guy goes, yeah, I'm, I want to buy it. And then Boaz says, oh, maybe you didn't know this other part of the story. And then Boaz says, what day thou buyest the field of land of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth, the Moabite, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. So she's he's going, oh, if you buy the land, you have to marry Ruth, the foreigner over there. And then when you marry her, her children are going to be the uh, the inheritors. Are, are totally cool with that. And uh, And the kinsman says, oh, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem now my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So Boaz kind of sets this guy up. He knows that the guy doesn't want to marry a foreigner, doesn't want to take on Ruth, but starts with the land and then says, oh, but if you don't want it, I'll do it. And he's, oh, you, you know, you, you can do it. You can pay for their debt and, uh, and you can marry Ruth too. Just what Boaz wanted to do. But again, if you don't know these laws, you miss out how Boaz uh, how it works it out. And so this was the manner of the four. Uh, and then it tells us this thing. Oh, by the way, I love this is the narrator jumps in with context. Verse seven, chapter four. Now this was the manner and former time in Israel concerning redeeming, concerning changing for to confirm all things. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and thus was the testimony in Israel. Therefore, the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. So that's how you knew that it was a deal. Swap your shoes. And so he does. So Boaz uh, says unto the elders and to everyone, they're all just there, so you can't go back on it now, and says, um, ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilean's, and all that was Mal- Malon's, and of the uh, hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased up to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of this place, ye are witnesses this day. And again, that was one of the things that they would save the family so that the, his, the young man's would, his line would continue. So he does that. So he's just this really outgoing guy. He just does all of these things. So he makes everybody witness right there and they do. And all the people were in the gate and the elders and they're like, we're witnesses. And the Lord make the woman that has come into thine house, like Rachel and Leah, which two did build the house of Israel and do that worthy and Ephrathah. It's the name I can never remember, the little suburb of Bethlehem, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed, which the Lord shall give unto thee, this young woman. Now remember, in the Abrahamic covenant, one of the blessings is that they would have family. They would have posterity. So they're call- the people are at the gate and they're calling out the blessing, right? May you be as as uh, blessed as Rachel and Leah. May you be blessed like these other ancient people, Tamar and etc. Boaz and Ruth. So they're all witnessing this great redemption that Boaz does, and this great combining families and blessing the um, Abraham's blessing upon them, and reminding us of that blessing. Now remember, at the beginning of the story, what was it like? My name is Naomi. Don't call me that though. Call me Mara, because the Lord hasn't blessed me. And now it's the opposite. The Lord is blessing them, right? Oh, we didn't realize it, but this whole time, the Lord is blessing them. And then you get this last, this just culminating moment. We're almost done with the book of Ruth. This is great. Hold on. This is it. Verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it to her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the woman, her neighbors gave it a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. And he is the father of Jesse. And he is the father of David. So remember, they left with no family and nothing. And because of Ruth's great loyalty and Boaz's great compassion and worthiness on doing the small things, obeying the Torah every day by being good to his workers, by let, being kind to the immigrant and Ruth being loyal, this great redemption comes to pass that Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz become a family and they have a son. And his name actually means, if I remember right, servant, Obed. He becomes a servant. 
And you're like, wow. And it's all this thing that was turned from the, the terrible of the beginning has turned in the past. So from this seemingly normal story of tragedy and good people doing the right things leads to the grandfather, the grandfather of David. Ruth is the great grandmother of David. These normal people, uh, in fact, an immigrant, right? The enemy, but become as of her loyalty and faithfulness. She becomes this great uh, woman and a great example. And because of Boaz's great compassion and following the day-to-day laws and covenants of just being a good guy every day, he becomes as well somebody great in the history of all of Israel. So do you remember the question that I asked at the beginning? Is the Lord really aware of me? And maybe great big miracles don't seem to happen in my life. But here we see in the book of Ruth, by doing regular day-to-day things, we can be blessed of the Lord and the Lord is very aware of us. Did you notice that God is only mentioned by some of the characters? The Lord bless us, the Lord remembers us, but there's no big overwhelming theme. The Lord doesn't speak in here. The narrator doesn't refer to the, the, uh, the Lord. There's no quote from the Lord. And I wonder if that's not part of the message as well, that in our day-to-day lives, the Lord is very aware of us. And when we do small and simple things every day, great things can come to pass and the Lord can work miracles in our lives, just like he does in the life of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz, who become the great-grandparents and great-grandparents of David. The line of the Lord himself. Through this line, Jesus will be born. Through normal, regular people doing normal, good, day-to-day things. Ruth is a beautiful story, and if you want to go back and read it again, now read it and see if you don't see, uh, understand what the barley harvest is about, what this kinsman redeemer, and what these rules are about, and see that loyalty and goodness of both Ruth and Boaz. And also, remember, look at yourself as each of the characters. How are we sometimes like Naomi, where we don't see the Lord's hand in our lives, but then we're blessed and we call on him and say, "Ah, I recognize now. How are we like Boaz? Are we asked to just be good every day, even when maybe people don't like it as well? We're not as handsome or or young as some other people. Do we recognize the Lord's hand and do we continue to do good things? And maybe we're sometimes like Ruth. Maybe we're the foreigner and the immigrant. Maybe we're a little bit different than everybody else. And yet we choose to be loyal and witness that the Lord is in our lives. And through them, great things will come to pass. That's the story of Ruth. All right, let's jump into one more quick story, and that's the book of Samuel. All right, whew, that was tough. All right, Samuel. The book of Samuel, we see first and second Samuel. So we're taking a big change in the historical events of the Old Testament. So we're really leaving this time of judges and we're moving into this new transition time. Samuel, the book of Samuel, first and second, is really one big book, but it's combined um, two books. The two books are combined into one book in real life, but because of the lengths of the scrolls, right, they're two big scrolls, that they're really one book. But that's why they have a first and a second, but it's really just part one and part two, but they were too big to put together. So that's why you have first and second Samuel. Samuel is the name of the prophet that takes place, especially in the beginning um, of this book. And we're going to see a number of main characters in this as well. So in the book of Samuel, you're going to see the story of Samuel himself. You're also going to see the story of Saul, uh, the first king, and you're going to see the story of David. And so these are some of the really great, the golden age, the unified kingdom of Israel are all going to be really set in these first um, few chapters. So that's where we get. Also, you're going to go through these stories and then back through some of the same stories in the book of Kings. So you're going to repeat the Kings and Chronicles. This all kind of goes together. So Samuel, one book, Kings afterwards, and then Chronicles is the same story written later about the same characters. And in the Jewish Old Testament, they're the last books as Chronicles, but they're going to go through. So I like to think of them as different. Samuel and Kings go a little bit more chronologically, but Chronicles is a retelling. And so they go together. So it, they're a compare and contrast. There's some different stories, some stories left out, different things happening, but you're going to see that much like we see in the Gospels, right? Different tellings of the same stories to give different perspectives and highlight different things. And so that's what's going to happen here. So when you're going to read through Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, you're like, ah, some of the same stories. So you don't get over the same stuff. Okay. 
So that's where we're hitting Samuel. But Samuel is going to be our first main character. And we're going to be introduced to him through one of the great heroines of the Old Testament, Hannah, his mother. So in chapter one of Samuel, we read a snip, read the uh, story of her. Now I want you to also remember whenever we meet characters and we spend a lot of time on them and we hear a lot from them, that's rare. <laughs> we don't often hear a lot about what's going on in the inner lives and the inner workings. Maybe a few verses, but in this case, we're going to get some of the most in-depth story of Hannah. Hannah is also going to, uh, Samuel's mother, is going to be a key character to understanding who Samuel is in the story. Okay, and There was a certain man of the city of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, and son of Jeth, and son of Elihu, and son of Tohu, and son of Zuf, and son of Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now there's a lot going on in this first section. So let me lay it out because it's going to be important later. So remember the tabernacle, the Israelites have marched around all over and then they land the tabernacle, that mobile temple building, and they park it in Shiloh, which is not Jerusalem. Okay. It's not Jerusalem. It's a little bit farther north and they park it, but they make it a permanent place. So that's where they are, Shiloh. So they've gone there. And the two sons of Eli's the high priest, and he has two sons, and those are the, the names of Hophni and Phineas, And so they're there, right? Eli, high priest, Hophni and Phineas, they're all there. And then we read about this man. Now, what's interesting is this Hannah's husband is just this man because it's not about him. The story isn't about him. He is righteous. He goes there to do his yearly sacrifice as he's supposed to. He's, he's a righteous man, but his wife, Hannah, is unable to bear children. And so we meet Hannah and we're like, interesting. So it's not about him. It's about her. And then you're going to see this theme that we're going to see over and over again about a, a couple uh, who is unable to have children. And so can you think of any other stories in the Old Testament or even the New Testament about a couple who can't have children? So you might have thought Sarah and Abraham, remember, they couldn't have children. So they have Ishmael and then they have Sarah doesn't have them, but Hagar does. And then we have Isaac, he's the miracle child. But then Rebecca, I'm sorry, Rebecca has, has a hard time. And then she has the twins, Esau and Jacob. And then Jacob's family off and on, right? Rachel does, can't have children for a long time, but Leah has a bunch. And so there's this ongoing, this whole family has a hard time having children. And then, so you're going to see it over and over again that the, the family has a hard time. In the future, from this time of Samuel, you're going to see that also of other women that cannot have children and, and can you think of one right at the outset of the New Testament? A woman, in this case, elderly, or for some reason cannot have a child, but her husband is worshiping at the temple, Elizabeth and Zachariah, Jesus's family members, right? Near family, this is their cousins, or at least from the same town or something. And so they are elderly, but they don't have children. And then they have John the Baptist. And so we're going to see this theme over and over again of uh, people who cannot have children, except by the grace of God, except through faith and miracles. The Lord has to intervene on their behalf. Abraham, Sarah, Rebecca, Jacob, Isaac, Ray, Leah does a great job, but Rachel has a hard time. And then Elizabeth, right? Baby John, and even Mary, the mother of Jesus, only by the act of God is she able, right? She doesn't even have a husband. And so she's able to have a child. So we see this theme only by the intervention of God. So we know that this is God's action that is making this happen. So we're introduced to this man who is righteous, goes to the tabernacle at Shiloh, and Hannah uh, cannot have children. Okay, that was a super lot packed in there. But now we know more about Hannah. She is unable to have a child, but her husband is righteous. And when the time came um, that Elkanah, that's the, this man, offered, he gave to... Uh, Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. They give them the portions of the uh, sacrifice, his other wife. But to Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And 
her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Again, we see her husband loves her, but she's unable to have a child. But but he she has a great husband who do, loves her anyway, but she's teased about it. And and as he did so year by year, when he went up to the house, so this, this husband, Elkanah, was awesome. But as he went up there, she provoked her, her enemy, or probably that other sister wife, and she wept and did not eat. And then Elkanah, her husband, then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? And what a cool guy, right? He doesn't hold it against her that she can't have kids. He's but it's still great that we're together. And Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. And now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple uh, of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And so her husband tries to console her, but she's inconsolable. She just feels terrible that she can't have this thing, this blessing that she really wants, this family. And even though her husband's great, she feels terrible. So she's just really troubled. Now, Eli's the high priest. And so he's sitting outside the temple when all this, and he sees it. And she vows a vow. And it says this, and she vowed a vow, this is Hannah, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thy handmaid, but what thou give thine handmaid a man-child. And I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. So she makes a vow. It's called the Nazarite vow. And the Nazarites are specially dedicated servants. We talked about it a little bit when we talked about Samson. And one of the things is they don't cut their hair, right? Like Samson. Usually it's only for a certain period of time, like a month or two. They also don't drink alcohol. They don't touch dead things. There are a bunch of rules. And during that vow, it's like the idea of fasting, that when you do this thing, you're showing that extra dedication you want to make to the Lord. By the way, if you've ever seen someone who has Rastafari and they have the dreadlocks, they are doing the same vow and they've taken it today and taken it to mean something to them, but they don't cut their hair. So that's why they have the dreadlocks because their hair mats and grows together because they have taken a vow to, to God. So interesting that this vow continues, but, but she says, if you give me a son, I will dedicate to him, to you, not just for a month but his entire life. And no, that's what she's saying, by no um, razor will come upon his head. I won't. She's vowing he will be a special dedication to the Lord. And then it says, as she was saying this, Eli marked her mouth, could see that she was praying uh, to herself. And he's, um, man, she's drunk. Like she's over there muttering to herself. So he mistaken and misunderstands that she's drunk. And she says, are you drunk? What are you doing? And Hannah's, no, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit and I have uh, drunk uh, neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. So no, I'm not drunk. I'm just so sorrowful. And I love how she says it. I am. I've poured out my soul for out of the abundance of my complaint and the grief have I spoken hitherto. And then he realizes he like, okay, go in peace. And so, she worships and the Lord hears her prayer. What a testimony that when we cry out to the Lord and we pour out our soul to him, that he will hear us. He, we may not always be blessed. Obviously, she's been praying for a child for a long time, but uh, we hear that this is the Lord. The Lord is going to bless her with a special blessing and she is going to be able to conceive. Now, sometimes our blessings aren't answered, but I love that in this case that she is blessed uh, with a child. And then, and who's this special miracle baby going to be? In the other stories, who was the special miracle baby, right? It's going to be Isaac. It's going to be Jacob and Esau. It's going to be Joseph and Benjamin. It's going to be uh, John the Baptist. It's going to be Jesus Christ. So whenever we see these stories where the Lord is blessing them, it's because God is intervening. So this child is a special child. And in this case, who's the child? Samuel. So the introduction we have to Samuel is about his beloved parents, the love they have for each other and they have for the Lord and how Hannah dedicates him for his entire life before he's born. So she's blessed with a very special child who will be dedicated to the Lord, Samuel. And the name Samuel means the Lord hears. Awesome. In chapter two, we, uh, she has the baby and she has this beautiful hymn, a beautiful song uh, that she sings. 
And I want you to take special care to read through 1 Samuel 2. It's very similar to the songs and prayers that are sung in the, the Gospel of Luke. Both Elizabeth, when she has Zacharias, when he has a son, he, when remember, he's uh, like mute, but then after the baby is born and he sings out a, a poem and a song and he sings. And then also when Mary, the mother of Jesus, she sings a song when she finds out she is going to uh, have a baby. Mary sings about the humble being brought high and the Lord blessing them. And Zacharias sings about the blessings of the covenant and how the Lord has remembered them and will finally save his people through John and Jesus. And Hannah is going to sing a song similarly. So you should, we should be thinking of all of these if you uh, together, that they should be really reminding us of these exact same stories and how these songs go together. Luke certainly is when he relates Zacharias and Mary's songs. And they have, that's, I think it's the Benedictus, it's called for John and the Magnificat for Mary in the Latin, but very cool songs. So go read those in Luke, but let's read Hannah's prayer or her song when Samuel is finally born. And this is, it says she prays in chapter two. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord, and mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, and there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like unto our God. Talk no more so exceedingly profoundly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with strength. They that were full hath hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them, and the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So this is obviously not just about the baby Samuel, but about the kingdoms and nations that are going to come because of Samuel's great blessing as a prophet that we're going to see Saul and David and the kingdom of Christ, right? Who is the, the true king come. And she is praising that the Lord is going to bless, give all the blessing and the, those, whether we shouldn't be too proud because the Lord is going to humble us, but he brings up who he wants to bless. And those are going to be more of the themes and ideas you're going to see in Samuel, the things that she just prayed and is trying to teach us about her son. Um, that is a pretty good place to start. We've just been introduced to Samuel and then we're going to meet him in chapter three. So when he's a little boy, remember Hannah has said that she will dedicate him. So she brings him to the temple to Eli and there he's going to be, uh, live there and serve as for the rest of his life. And so he is dedicated special. So he, he comes up to the uh, temple and this is the famous story, which I love. Samuel goes to bed. He's a little boy and he goes to bed there and, and Eli, the high priest is there. And it says that when the lamp of God went out of the temple of the Lord, where the ark was and Samuel lay down to sleep and the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here am I. And he ran to Eli. So he doesn't, Samuel doesn't recognize that it's the Lord. He thinks uh, Eli is calling him. And so he runs to Eli and he says, here I am for thou callest me. And he said, I called not lie down again. And he went and he lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he, Eli, answers again, I called not, my son, lie down again. And Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Samuel doesn't recognize who's calling him. 
And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he arose and he went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called at, as at other times, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Ah, what a beautiful testimony, how as we learn to hear the Spirit, that we can answer, Here am I, and your servant heareth. And that's my testimony, that we will all hear the Lord and recognize him in our lives and be able to be close to him and serve him as he calls us and asks us to go out into action. Remember the questions that I asked at the beginning, not only what did we see in Ruth, but how we read scripture. We should ask, how does it make us feel? What do we see in it in ourselves? But the second part, what does it invite us to do? Does it invite us to be more like Ruth, loyal, Boaz, kind, Naomi, resilient? Does it make us think of Hannah, who is devout and prayerful? Does it maybe even Elkanah, the husband, who is loving and kind? Perhaps it reminds us to be like Samuel, that we listen and we obey. What is the Spirit asking you to do in these stories? That's the question that we can ask ourselves as we read through the story of Ruth and 1 Samuel. All right, everybody, that's it.